Hello everyone, thanks for watching. My name is Nathaniel Kramer, also known as Preaching Musician here on YouTube. And in this video, we're going to be talking about what is the gospel. And we're going to be answering a question that I put out in the, next, in the previous video on this series. How can a God be just and merciful at the same time? How can God, with pure justice, look on someone who doesn't deserve uh, anything from Him and grant Him uh, anything good? I mean, it's, it's a very, very serious question and very difficult question. But God has the answer for it. And we're going to be looking at a chapter we looked at in two videos ago, Romans chapter 3. And we're just going to continue down the path in this chapter. We left off at verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in the next verse, and a couple of verses after that, it lays out how God and His pure justice is able to grant us mercy. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. So we'll start <clears throat> at verse 24. I'm just going to read through it, and then we'll take it phrase by phrase, like, like the previous videos. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To, de to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is, ex it is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So this is probably, uh, by many, many theologians, this is called the crux of the Christian faith right here. And it's very important to understand what this passage means. So we're going to break it down phrase by phrase. And I'm going to start out by just the word, being justified. That word literally means for God to declare somebody to be just. For It's a legal declaration, a legal statement that someone is righteous, that someone is just, that someone has a good standing legally. So justified freely by His grace. Right away the Bible says, look, if you're going to go to heaven, you're not going to pay for it. If you're going to be justified, it's going to be free. All right? It's pretty simple. I mean, you know what freely means. I don't need to define that to you. We don't really need to look into the Greek for this one. Free means free. But then it continues. It says, by His grace. And we looked at the word grace in the last video, but in the New Testament, it has more of a meaning. Basically, it's when God gives us something that we don't deserve. I'm going to look at another passage. I'm going to be looking at Ephesians uh, chapter 2. As it goes into a little bit more what, it, what the Bible set means when it says that justification is freely by His grace. It says in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So there, it, it, it kind of reiterates it for you. Salvation is a gift. It's free. And if you think you have to pay for it, it's not, it's not God's version of salvation. It's your version of salvation. And guess what? God, God's not going to accept someone else's way. He accepts His way of salvation. So, being justified freely by His grace. Now, if something is free, if something is a gift, that means you don't pay for it, but it means someone else has to pay for it. And so we get into that uh, in, in the next couple of phrases. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The word redemption literally means a payment for ransom. It's, it's, it's the idea that we are shackled in sin. Sin has taken hold of us. It is, we are in the bondage of sin. And it is holding us for ransom. And the only ransom that can be paid can be paid through Christ Jesus. Now, most of you know who Jesus is, but I'm going to get a little bit into him just in case... Uh, you have issues with who was Jesus and, and where did he come from. Uh, most of you know that he was born of the Virgin Mary. And I'm going to read a, a, from the book of John, actually the first chapter, first verse of the book of John. We'll talk about who Jesus is real quick. It says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word, capital W, was with God, and the Word, capital W, was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So here is this person. The reason why I say person is because it is a personal noun. It's capitalized. He is called the Word. And in the beginning, he was with God and he was God. Sort of, sort of the same idea that maybe you could say, my hand is with me and my hand is me. You could point to my hand and say, hey, look, there's Nathaniel. You could point to my hand and say, look, that thing's with Nathaniel. Okay? So he's part of God and he's with God. 
But it continues, it says, The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. We go back to verse 3 there. It says, All things were made by Him. And if you look at Genesis chapter 1, everything that God created with the exception of man and woman, everything that He created was, made, was created through His Word. And if you look at it, it says very simply, And God said, let there be light. And God said, and it goes on and on. So for the first six days of creation, everything that God created was through His Word. And that Word was an actual person. Now this person was known as the Word, but in verse 14, he becomes known as someone different. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bear witness of him in Christ, saying, This is he of whom I speak. He that cometh after me is before, before, me, before he was before me. And of his fullness have all received in grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of meaning behind the word Jesus. It literally means salvation. We won't get into that too much. But Jesus was literally known as the Word. He was with God. He was God. He became flesh. He did not be, start his existence when he was born of the Virgin Mary. He literally became flesh, and he was the only begotten of the Father. This is very important, and the word begotten is left out in many of your modern translations because they think it's a word that's too complicated and you don't understand it, but the word is so important. I don't think it should have been left out. The, Lord, the word literally means only genetically born, not one and only, which a lot of translations use, but only genetically born. And the reason why that's so important is because the, your blood, we know this through science, your blood comes from your father. And the DNA gene for sin would also come from your father. So by being conceived of the Holy Ghost, his genes came from the Heavenly Father, which allowed him to live a sinless, perfect life on earth. Yes, he was still tempted as a man. He was a man. He was still went through the same trials and tribulations that we go through on earth but he did it without sin. And that's a very important thing because Jesus was righteous. He came down to earth and he died on the cross for our sins. And we'll get into what for our sins means. But he died on a cross and then he rose again from the dead. That's a little bit about who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and who Jesus always will be. So he is, uh, salvation is freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And it goes on to explain that redemption, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. So God set Jesus forth. In other words, the Father set His Son before Him. He exhibited His Son legally before Him. And that's the literal meaning behind that. God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Now there's a long word in there. I'm sure many of you are caught that word and like, what in the world does propitiation mean? That's a very long word. And if you look in the book of Hebrews, and we won't turn there, but there's a passage there where propitiation, the Greek word for that is, is translated to the word mercy seat. And there's a lot of history behind that word, and I'll, I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of a primer on it. In the Old Testament, uh, God had set up for the high priest in, uh, in Leviticus chapter, I think, 16 or 17, and also in Exodus, God set up for the high priest to have a mercy seat. And this mercy seat was to be on, on, the, on the Ark of the Covenant, inside the tabernacle, inside the Holy of Holies. And that place is a place that only the high priest could go. And he would take a sacrifice of an animal, and he would sprinkle that animal on that mercy seat as an atonement for sin, as a sacrifice or a substitute for sin. Now, that didn't literally pay the price. It was a picture of what would happen later. And that mercy seat became that, the place where that sacrifice was made. And more than that, the Bible said also in Exodus that the mercy seat was the place where God said that I will meet you. So that mercy seat became the mediator between the high priest and the people and God. When the Bible says that Jesus is our propitiation, it means that Jesus literally fulfilled that picture of the mercy seat. He became the mediator between God and man. He became the sacrifice, the atonement, the substitute for us. And, and there's so much, so much in that word, but we'll move on. The Bible says propitiation through faith in His blood. And I'll go back to that phrase, faith through His blood, at the end. To declare His righteousness 
for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So, that, so what he says here is that God exhibited his son as a mercy seat, as a propitiation, substitute, sacrifice, mediator, all of these things in one. And there's much more than that. But just in this passage, that's what it's talking about. And he declared the righteousness that Jesus lived. We know that he was the only righteous person that ever lived. He declared his righteousness for the remission or payment or a legal cancellation of debt is the literal meaning there. The remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And the, and the meaning behind past through the forbearance of God is talking about before the cross, God forbore the, the, the sins until the cross came and then he would, he would pour out his justice on Jesus there. But then he continues says, to declare, I say at this time, right now, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So what does all this mean? This is really complicated. I know I'm going to try to simplify it for you. The basic idea is that when Jesus was on the cross, he, he had perfect righteousness. In order for God to declare us righteous, which is what justified means, what justification means, declare us righteous, he literally took the legal record of Jesus and applied it on us. But in order to do that, there's another verse in the Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin for us. In other words, the sin that we committed, that we deserve hell for, that we deserve the wrath of God for, that sin was taken from our record. And when I say our, it's talking about believers here, not, not just anybody, but believers. We'll get to that later. But it was taken from our record and was placed on Jesus Christ so that all the wrath and all the holy hatred that God had for, for sin, for iniquity, for transgression, all the things that we've done, all the guilt was placed on Jesus Christ. And when he died on that cross, he bore our sin. He bore the wrath that we deserve. It wasn't just the Roman soldiers beating him with a cat of nine tails. That, that, that was the torture that he went through. That was just the surface of what he went through. Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I, and I didn't mean to go to this place, but I really feel led to do this. He, he, he literally asked God if, if it be possible. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And the cup there, it's not talking about just the Roman whip, the Roman cross. It's not just talking about that. Jesus sweat literally drops of blood. And we're, we're not talking about a cross. So There's many people that have gone to a cross without sweating drops of blood. We're talking about the very wrath of his Father being crushed on him. In fact, in Isaiah, it says that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. God himself and his wrath came down on his Son and crushed his Son under the wrath for our sin. Jesus took all of that for us. He took an eternity of pain, not just on his body, but on his soul. And he cried out from that cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When he did that, it wasn't just God looking away because he couldn't bear the, his justice being poured out. It was literally God against his son. Not because he hated his son, but because he hated who his son had become. He became our sin. So literally, the righteousness of Jesus could be applied to us. So how does this happen for us? How does God apply this righteousness. Well, if we look back at verse 25, I said we'd get back to this phrase. It says, Whom God has set forth to be propitiation through faith in his blood. If you look at verse 26, it says that God could be the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That's where it's at right there. I, I want to look at another passage. John chapter 3. And if you're familiar at all with the Bible, you know the passage, John 3:16. And it's become a very popular verse, and I, I love that. Um, I'm going to read it real quick. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But if you read that down, just two more verses, it really draws a line in the sand between the people that are condemned and the people who are not. It says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
In other words, there's two groups of people in this world. There are, there's the group of people that believe on Jesus Christ and believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Those people are not condemned. Then there's the other group that don't believe. Those people are condemned. And if you need any more proof of that, the, a few verses down in verse 36, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Literally, the wrath for our sin, the, the holy wrath and righteous wrath that God has for us as sinners. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, that's literally looming over your head. And it's the very patience of God that is withholding it from falling. It could fall any moment. That's what it's talking about when it says, The wrath of God abideth on him. You don't want to be that person. So how do we get this salvation? By believing in Jesus I'll come back to that, but I want to finish off in Romans chapter 3. It says, where, in bo where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? No, or nay, but by the law of faith. In other words, if you think for one second, after what God went through on the, to send His Son on the cross, after all the suffering that His Son did to pay for our sin, if you think that you're going to do some little work and come to God and come with your record and say, Here, God, here's my record. If you think you're going to come to Him, that's just going to insult God. That's just going to make Him more angry. You don't want to do that. It's the law of faith. It's the law of believing in Jesus. Now, when I say believe in Jesus, or when the Bible says believe in Jesus, it's not just talking about believing in His existence. A lot of people believe in His existence, okay? Even atheists believe that Jesus existed. At least most, most of them do. And uh, the devil believed that Jesus existed. But when we talk about believing in someone or something even, it's, not, it's more than just believing in an existence. It, let's say you were to go on a, pilot, on a plane and you were to tell the pilot, I believe in you. Uh, I would hope that means more than just, I believe you exist. That would be kind of silly. When you tell a pilot when you're about to fly on his plane, I believe in you. You're saying, I believe that you're going to come through for me. I'm trusting in you. And that's what the meaning is there. When it's saying that believing in Jesus, it means you're trusting in Him. You have full confidence in Him. So the question that many people ask, how do, how do I go to heaven? How do I know that I'm going to heaven? It's simply this. Who are you trusting in? Are you trusting in the work of Jesus who died on the cross for our sin, who paid the sin debt, by, by, uh, by the redemption that, that he did, who rose again from the grave, conquering death? Are you trusting in him or are you trusting in yourself? Are you trusting in the works that you do? Are you trusting in your, your baptism maybe, or maybe your membership to a church? I mean, there, there's a long list we could go through. But there, there it is right there. When you meet God, which record are you going to present? Are you going to present your record? Say, God, this is what I did. I, I think that you'll be pleased. I'm going to tell you right now, that's just going to insult God. God is, is deeply offended. When you come to God with your own record after all that He did, after all that He put Himself and His Son through, and you dare come to God on his, who's sitting on His throne and try to present your record, God, God will have no place with you. He just won't. The Bible is very clear about that. But if you come to God in humility, and you come with the record of Jesus Christ and you say, God, I, I got nothing for you. I, I, I don't deserve this, but your son died for me and I plead the blood. And you just come here and you, and you just come to him and you say, God, I got nothing but your son. And that's what God wants. That's what he wants to see. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. And that's where it's at right there. It's what do you believe? That's where the question is. So I know I said a lot in this video and I'm going to, I have the passages here. I hope that you research this. If you don't know Jesus, please, if you need any help, you can message me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have my email available and I, I want you to get help if, if you don't know him. I will help you any way I can. Please, 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 don't just throw this video aside and be like, oh, whatever, you know, big deal. It is a big deal. We're talking about eternity here. So please, I, I beg you, if you don't know Christ, seek God. The Bible says that if, if you seek Him, He's a rewarder of them that seek Him. So seek Him. Seek Him in His Word. 
And if you want to know where to start, I'd say start in the, in the book of John. Start reading the Gospel of John. It lays out what Jesus did while he was on earth. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you.